Welcome to the last session of our workshop. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our last speaker, who is also our keynote speaker, Jim O'Shee from the University College uh, Dublin. Um, I think Jim doesn't need uh, an introduction, uh, especially in a Salarshan workshop. Uh, he teaches at the University College Dublin. Uh, he has written and uh, a lot uh, on sellers. He, there is uh, a book he edited. It came out a few, few months ago, Sellers and His Legacy, um, with many articles and many contributors who were um, who have inspired also us in organizing this this meeting. He has published uh, one of the first introductory books on sellers in 2007, I think, Sellers Naturalism with a Normative Turn, and he has extensively published on Kant <coughs> as well. So today we are gonna listen to his talk, Reflections on Sellers Kantian Naturalism. We thank him for being here, and please, thanks. Thank you, uh, Luca. I'd like to thank Luca Cordy and Antonio Nunziante for organizing this conference. An absolutely wonderful conference here in Padua. To, yesterday we saw where Galileo lectured, and so there's no pressure on me today with that. This reminds me in Northern Ireland when I came to Ireland in 1992, the person who I gave my first talk at a university, and there's a rope bridge up in Northern Ireland. Now it's fairly safe, but it used to just be across uh, the ocean for onto a little island. But I was nervous, you know, it was just, you look like you're gonna fall, and then he, I made it back to the other side, and he said, well, now you're not nervous for your talk. Uh, you were, thought you were going to die, but now you're calm for your talk. Um, I just, today, I, I realized I don't have anything uh, in my paper about Seller's views on the history of philosophy per se. I'm just doing an instance of it, but um, fortunately, the three papers today have been wonderful in that regard. So Antonio's paper on Sellers on Leibniz, it really illustrated in some ways, as Antonio brought out, how you, you, you can't detach Sellers' own views from when he's discussing a philosopher in the history of philosophy, that Sellers' own view of what's true is mixed into what he finds plausible in the philosophers. And then Carlo's paper, I think, was on, the, on Carnap and Sellers was in the spirit of how I like to do it, and Sellers like to do it. I mean, you talk about Carnap and Sellers, but Carlo gave us a view of what he finds plausible and what less plausible, and that's what I'll be doing as well with Sellers and, and Kant. And then uh, Dionysus' paper on Sellers and the history of philosophy, I can use the truth predicate, which is very useful. Everything Dionysus said is true. And so that, uh, I think it captured the way I think of Sellers and the history of philosophy. But let me, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I like to think of Sellers as a Kantian naturalist outlook. But I end up detaching Sellers' own most famous Kantian way of putting his own view, um, having to do with number two, the idea that the manifest image ontology is strictly speaking false, that there are no such things, Sellers says, as the objects, yellow bananas, red apples, there are no such things in the end. They get reconceptualized as states of the perceiver in the scientific image. Um, that, I'm not, I'm gonna have some troubles with that. And then uh, at the end I just raise some other questions about Sellers on Kant that I'm interested in. Okay, so you all will know a lot about this now. I've, it, it's come up in several papers. Sellers and Kant, I think, share a lot of views on conceptual thinking, which is Sellers' general term for intentionality. Uh, perception is an instance of conceptual thinking for Sellers. Volition is an instance of conceptual thinking for Sellers. Um, in Kantian terms, the very possibility of directly apprehending or knowing any change or event as such whether, and this is what was crucial in Kant, whether inner or outer sense, so the inner is in the same status as the outer for Kant and Sellers, already requires the possession of certain concepts for Kant and Sellers that determine the rules of possibility and necessity for a wider system of objects and states of affairs of which this experience must be implicitly conceived to be a lawful part. <clears throat> 
You don't get to know any little thing without knowing a lot of other things. That's the basic idea. That's not a quote from Sellers, but it sums up a lot of things that he says. It sums up a lot of Kant's view, I think. So, you know, this leads to a certain kind of holism in semantics, in epistemology, and in the philosophy of mind, in Kant and Sellers. Um, and then it, the space of reasons view Sellers talks about to call something an instance of knowledge um, isn't to describe some isolated state, it's to classify it normatively in, in the space of giving and asking for reasons. To call, if someone knows something, you're giving it a certain normative status. You're saying they can back it up, you can depend on it, you can give reasons, and so on. But simultaneously from early on, so Marvin Farber, the American phenomenologist who was popularizing Husserl's view, and, and Farber was trying to naturalize Husserl, and in his um, autobiographical reflection, Sellers says, that was no doubt a big influence on my thinking, that the structures that Husserl was giving you about the directly realist intentional knowledge of the world could be given a naturalistic explanation. But it's very puzzling and the people that are called left-wing Salarzians are the ones that find it very difficult to see and I don't blame them. What would it look like, what would it even look like to give a naturalistic interpretation of Husserl or of Kant? to give a naturalistic interpretation of, now here comes Kant stuff, the rule-governed, constitutive, objectivity-enabling role of concepts. You know, how do we do that? What would that be like? So if, if Kant, certain rule-governed concepts are necessary for knowing any objects at all, what is it to give us a, a sideways on naturalistic account of that same structure? But that sellers, in my, on my reading, naturalism with a normative turn, Kantian naturalism, that's the central task, is to say how those things go together. So here's another Kantian thing, Seller's autobiographical reflections. He reports um, during his Oxford youth reading, Kant convinced him that a skeptic who grants knowledge of even the simplest fact about an event occurring in time is in effect granting knowledge of the existence of nature as a whole, I was sure he was right. So this is this Kantian conviction from earlier on, again, that any knowledge of, even of your own sense impression, takes place only against a background of a view of a, an objective world with lawful relations. I mean, Sellers thinks that's right. He thinks Kant had it. I think that's right. Strawson thinks that's right. Um, so I guess we think that one's right. But Sellers adds right away, I was sure Kant was right, but his own question haunted me, how is it possible that knowledge has this structure? Um, a couple of nights ago I was just thinking that's, it, it's like what Sellers talks about, the, la the, the last stand of special creation is really the problem of self-knowledge and the problem of conceptual, the problem of the human rational being where it's hard to explain it in terms of um, bottom-up terms, in terms of little things adding up to a bigger thing, because you don't have conceptual thinking, you don't have knowledge, you don't have meaning unless you have a whole to start with. So the mind is, is what grasps that whole. How do you give an evolutionary account of how that whole came to be? And so that's why Seller says it's the last stand of special creation that were made in the image of God and so on. But of course, for sellers, it's the last stand because we'll, we'll do that. We'll somehow demystify that aspect. So the tension between dogmatic realism and its appeal to self-evident truth and transcendental idealism in which conceptual structures hover over a non-cognitive manifold of sense became almost intolerable. Sellers always hedges that way. Well, you know, was it intolerable or not? You know, it was, no, it was almost intolerable. It wasn't until much later that I came to see that the solution of the puzzle lay in correctly locating the conceptual order in the causal order and correctly interpreting the causality involved. 
and he wasn't even sure how to formulate that project. So on the one hand, he's saying Kant's right about concepts and understanding, but he wants to naturalize this, understand how it fits with our picture of the human being as an evolved natural creature with non-mysterious capacities. Um, something about that involves understanding the conceptual order in the causal order of nature, but what's that mean? So what's it to, to do that job? Well, he says he had to develop, this is Seller's self-reporting, his early thinking, an adequate naturalistic philosophy of mind is what it required, especially of the intentional structure of mental acts. He's got to give a philosophy of conceptual thinking that naturalizes it somehow. And it wasn't until 10 years later, so this is the mid-40s, 10 years after Oxford or whatever, when I began to equate language with thought, and this is funny because in, in the late article, Mental Events, Sellers says, um, I've often been reported as holding the view that I equated language with thought. Nothing could be further from the truth. All right, so all you have to do, go ahead. When I began to equate language with thought, so he says it, but um, I think what he means, the, the reason, uh, of course, is that he has a view of mental ease, which isn't, language per se, it's modeled on language, and he has a view of animal representational systems. So he's got a much broader view that doesn't just say thinking is language, but verbal behavior is the crucial model for thought, and it is an instance of thought. So it's, it's roughly he's explaining how his um, functionalism that he modeled on Wittgenstein's meaning as use theory and Ryle's theory um, is going to give him a way of giving a naturalistic, supposedly, account of what thinking is. I say supposedly because it's going to be a normative functionalism, so it's not going to be easy to see how that's clearly naturalistic, but we'll get there. So that's, I think, I think what he means by what was needed was a functional theory of concepts which there would make their role in reasoning rather than a supposed in origin and experience their primary feature. Um, the influence of Kant was to play a decisive role. Um, I think that's what he has in mind. I think there's a line from Kant on concepts as rules, which gets rid of the idea that intentionality is a mysterious relation to the world. Knowledge of an object has to do with various modal properties. You know, you, you, you're giving... a. Um, Knowledge of what it is to be a table is to classify it as a thing that obeys and that behaves in a certain lawful way. So if I turn my back, it's still there. If I blink my eyes, it doesn't disappear. So I think he's doing intentionality in terms of rules. Concepts are rules, and this gets rid of the idea of a mysterious non-natural relation, I think he thinks. I think you find the same thing in pragmatism, in William James, and in... Um, uh, the later Wittgenstein and Ryle. Now, we're being very sweeping here, but the general idea that intentionality can be understood in rules and in terms of functions rather than in terms of a Husserlian or Cartesian non-natural relation to the world. Not, not, to, not to say more about Husserl than I should, because I don't. Uh, I think I just blew that up. Let's see if... Yes, good. Same thing in ethics. In Sellers reporting back on his early days, he says um, he was very much influenced by H.A. Pritchard's deontological intuitionism, so kind of direct grasp of oughts and the concept of an ought. And Stevenson's, for example, emotivism or A.J. Ayers, the idea that what really moves us is something natural, an emotion. Um, Somehow though, that dispute would have to be aufgehoben, Seller says, into a naturalistic framework. So Stevenson wins in one way. It's going to be naturalistic. But Stevenson loses in that it's not going to be that um, what's wrong is boo, you know, boo, the boo hooray theory of emotivism. Not that Stevenson was that crude by any means. But emotivism isn't the way to explain ethical concepts as genuine concepts. 
So Sellers wanted the motivational natural account of the emotivists, but with a more deontological account of, of moral concepts, something that could, could explain why morality is not just getting someone to feel a certain way, but involves rational intersubjective arguments. Again, a Kantian naturalism, a sort of naturalizing of Kant. Again, he reports while working at Iowa in the 30s and 40s with Herbert Feigl, the logical empiricist. Sellers says um, that the two of them shared a common purpose to formulate a scientifically oriented naturalistic realism. This is the background, but it's not just dogmatic, I don't think, um, the background in realism, but maybe it is a deep-seated presupposition, too, of, of his outlook which would save the appearances. So he wants a scientifically naturalist realism, but will save the appearances instead of just eliminating them, that will explain them. But Feigl was then surprised, given that we're teammates in this scientific naturalism, with the seriousness with which I took such as ideas as causal necessity. Why do you need causal necessity? We should be humans. Synthetic a priori knowledge. Are you kidding me? You know, in, the, in, in that period. See, I. Lewis had a sophisticated view, but it was analytic a priori. Um, intentionality. I mean, others were behaviorist at that time in a way that led them to think they could avoid talking about intentionality. Ethical intuition. You can see how all these are anathema at that time to much that was going under the banner of scientific naturalism in the logic. I'm generalizing widely here, but so is Sellers in this context. And the problem of universals. And Feigl was surprised even when I made it clear that my aim was to map these structures, these Kantian structures, into a naturalistic, even a materialistic metaphysics. But of course, what that mapping is, is deeply puzzle. And uh, um, again, it's like that, what exactly is it to give a naturalistic reading of Husserl or of Kant? What are we doing when we map these things onto a naturalistic metaphysics? All the tough questions are hidden in the word map, but that's the challenge. That's what Sellers wants to do. Now, I'm not going to, I have other papers recently where I'm talking about this, but um, one way uh, in which the manifest image is preserved to the end, I think, in this, throughout the original image, the manifest image, the scientific image, is in the account of persons. And sellers, at the most abstract level, I mean, persons have bodies, they have identities, depending on where they live, all these psychological features. But sellers agrees with one, I think, I could be wrong, agrees with one crucial Kantian view, that the concept of a person, a thinking thing, isn't the concept of an object. It's not the sort of thing. It, you can then argue that, a, like Kant does, that a person is in a material world and, and embodied and so on. But what it is to be a, con, a person is to be a self-conscious consciousness. and and. Sellers thinks Kant was right in the paralogisms, Sellers' radically anti-Cartesian view of the self, as I read it. There, there is no substantial immateriality that comes out of Kant and Sellers' view, even in Kant's view, I think, of the self. That's what the paralogism is. So, I think Sellers thinks that the view of a thinking self in Kant which is just a form of thinking. It's representing your world in a lawful way is what gives you self-awareness. Making the distinctions between a world that you know and your experience of it. It's a very difficult view, but Kant's view is, what is a self? If you go looking for the self, you're not going to find it. What gives you a self? Conceiving of your world as a lawful, objective world. I'm not talking about things in themselves, I'm talking about nature. 
And that's what gives you awareness of your own history, that very distinction between you and your world. So, and that's not a thing. That's not an object. It's a functional normative unity. It's created by thought, and it is a thinking thing. I mean, I'm babbling on about this because that's the thing I think that's true all the way through all. That's why the manifest image is not overridden by the scientific image, and that the manifest image remains true is that. It's not, nothing to do with objects. It's persons. And then norms are the same sorts of functional things. Thoughts are the same sorts of... So Seller's view is that the manifest... There's a, there's a um, stereoscopic vision where the scientific image and the manifest image are fused. How does he do it? This is the crucial move. What it is to be a person and what it is to be a thought isn't to be a thing. Okay. Isn't to be an object that could get replaced. Okay, so it's this override, and my view is that Sellers holds that all the way to the end, and he believes that, but that, I could be wrong about that. That's an interpretation of Sellers. There's a nice quote at the end of Phenomenalism I was talking with Dionysus about, where Sellers says, um, a person is a bundle of processes, but the concept of a person isn't the concept of a bundle of processes. So we are just bundles of processes in the end, in one sense, um, but who we are is the being that thinks of ourselves as persons, that distinguishes between ourselves and the world, and so that's what it is to be a person. Okay. So it's this overriding and enduring project of Sellers, that of defending a Kantian conception of our conceptual cognition, but at the same time attempting how to sketch how to naturalize scientifically that same conception that leaves us with all these left-wing Salarzian versus right-wing Salarzian debates. Roughly speaking, the left-wing Salarzians like Rorty, Brandom, and Sellers um, think it's hopeless to try to explain, as John McDowell puts it, and they have good arguments for this, but to give a sideways-on scientific naturalist explanation of what irreducible conceptual thinking is and the space of reasons. Um, serious issues come up about this. I mean, when you think of the world conceptually, that projects various possibilities and necessities. When you think of the world as a chemical system or a biological system or a physical system, that's a whole set of different necessities. and They're two different logical spaces, as it were. So what are you doing when you map the one onto the other? Are you just identifying them? Are you a a mere token, token identity theorist with functionalism. These are difficult issues. So Brandon, McDowell, and Rorty think it's hopeless to give this naturalistic account of the normative structures of rationality. And, and then they'll say, but by the way, that doesn't prevent us from being scientific realists in the good old fashioned sense that instrumentalism's wrong. Of course, everyone believes in unobservables these days, no problem. That doesn't prevent us from, um, it prevents us from nothing other than, from their perspective, other than Sellers' overgeneralized claim that scientific naturalism can explain everything. Right. But the right wing Salarzians think the left wing Salarzians have radically underestimated um, the power of Sellers' um, scientific naturalism. That, there, that Sellers um, has plausible accounts of how the mind works and of normativity itself, which are more in the scientific spirit than, than the left-wingers. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this distinction, but that's how it's come down to us. It's not always helpful. Okay, so how am I doing? I guess I can go till what, four o'clock or something? Is that, we started a little late yet? Um, Here's the most famous thing. It came out in Carlo's paper and in other papers from Sellers. If we just plop down with Sellers' transcendental idealism, what he interprets his replacement for Kant, it's this view, that the manifest image ontology of ordinary perceptible objects, yellow bananas, red apples, and so on, 
not persons and norms, because remember, they never get shown to be false in, on my reading, um, is ultimately false, as Seller says, I, there really are no such things. Now, his view here is that um, when you understand how color goes along with shape, for instance, and you have, Barclay was right, you have to have shape where you have color, but colors are mind-dependent entities in the sense that how are you going to explain hallucinations, vivid hallucinations? He doesn't have disjunctivism on his map, for instance. There's certain options he doesn't have on his map. Um, there are other arguments he has. The homogeneity of color I'll bring up in a minute very briefly. Um, but roughly, at the end of the day, the best explanation of our experience of red apples, for instance, will be that the redness in the way it's experienced in ordinary life with that shape will be more a feature of our central nervous system and our brain. It's all the way back to Galileo. Speaking of Galileo, Galileo said if you take away all the animals, then um, there's no more redness, no more colors, and so on. It's the standard view. Sellers has a very sophisticated version of it, but um, the apple's out there, but it's a basic swarm of this or that that causes central nervous systems like ours to sense in the red apple manner. I mean, that's his view. So the ontology of apples is false, but it's better explained by that more complicated story. Does everyone see that? He, he, he explains the appearances. Color ends up being a state of the perceiver rather than... And he bites certain bullets there because, I mean, he wants shape to go with color. So he's got to talk about how analogically somehow... But he's not just saying something's going in the, on in the brain. That's what he calls the topic neutral view that he criticizes. No, something that preserves redness and something that analogically preserves the geometry of, of colored objects is going on in there. So it's a radical view. And that's why he says we're going to need a new theory of consciousness. Science will discover different features of reality that aren't um, the same as normal physical chemical properties. I'm not a big fan of that aspect. Okay. So, here's an interesting thing for Sellers fans sometimes miss that Sellers rejects Kant's own arguments for transcendental idealism. He thinks they're bad arguments. So you can go through Science and Metaphysics chapter 2, and then Sellers says, but here's one that really works. I mean, what Sellers likes in Kant and what I like in Kant is all that stuff. Kant's arguments for transcendental idealism don't work, Seller says. There's only one that, well, there's two. Here's one that does. It's the distinction between perceptible physical colored objects and so on and the objects of theoretical science, swarms of particles and so on. So I think Sellers has two main arguments for what he calls transcendental idealism, which is the view to ordinary world of objects is a phenomenal world in Kant's sense, the world of appearances, and the noumena are the, whatever future science tells us is, exists. One of them is this argument from color. The other one is something about scientific theory succession. He's got a very kuhn feyerabend view of how the ontology of later theories replaces and explains the ontology of early theories. Now, I don't, I don't buy... I'm, there are aspects of those that I think are plausible but when they're used as arguments for the global falsity of our ordinary ontology, I think they're overstretched. So here's the two. Sellers has this argument from the homogeneity of color. It's called the grain argument these days, that um, our experience of color or our concept of color is of something colored through and through in a way that's just unexplainable by colorless particles, by the same thing just being a sum of colorless particles. And he tries to use that argument to say, I mean, you can move them into the brain, but that's just as bad, Seller says. That doesn't help. Descartes moved them into the brain. That doesn't help, because the brain is just a system of colorless particles on the new scientific view, as Descartes knows. Where does the miracle occur? And so Sellers thinks, um, Science will discover someday a dimension of neural processes which are 
reddings and pinkings and yellowings. And it, it, you know, he's saying, as a philosopher, I can't tell you what the theory will be, but I can tell you that there's going to have to be a theory. It's a bit like David Chalmers when he's speculating about ultimate theories of consciousness. There's going to have to be something more, Sellers is saying. So I'd rather have a theory myself that accounts for perceptual cognition, including non-conceptual representation. Sure, I like Sellers' view of that, but that doesn't take this radical road in A. The second one, I'm perfectly happy with Feyerabend and Kuhn-style ontological replacement models of scientific development. You know, Newton's mass, strictly speaking, doesn't exist. It's a realm of appearances that's best explained by Einsteinian mass. But why think that that's going to hold for all domains of biology? Are we going to explain organisms in a way that there are no longer organisms? I mean, I think this should be held as a contingent thesis. Per, this, Sellers shouldn't have offered the a priori thesis that all science is going to go this way, if I'm right that that's what he's doing. Um, Sellers will say, well, the laws don't all get reduced. The laws of the special sciences can be irreducible. But that, I mean, the better view of irreducible laws in chemistry goes with chemical kinds and quantifies over chemical objects. So um, I, I don't expect biology to necessarily, look, all the wind's been taken out of my sail anyway from A, where I'm not going to hold that there are no red apples in my theory of perception. I don't see why it's plausible to think that scientific explanations all going to fit this model of replacement ontologies. I don't think biology is going that way. It's a more it's more like Sellers' dad, Roy Wood Sellers, functional realization and levels of nature. Now this is this forces me to reject quite a bit in Sellers that otherwise I think of myself as very influenced by Sellers, but. I just don't think to preserve what's good in Sellers on A, I prefer A star and B star, where I'm perfectly happy, unlike Rorty, Brandom, and McDowell, I think theories, Sellers' great idea was to say, it's 1956, people are either dualists, if they're old fashioned, or they're neutral monists with sense data or, or whatever, pure experiences, or they're behaviorists. And Sellers was saying, we can have theories of inner mental representations, thoughts and sensings, while being later Wittgensteinians. We can, we, we, we can be, um, we can accept the linguistic turn, we can accept that meaning is public. This was what was ingenious about Sellers. But we can posit inner mental representations, real thoughts as functional entities, and real sensings without violating the later Wittgensteins. Peter Geech was doing the same thing in 1960 uh, or 62 on mental acts. So I quite like that, and a lot of the Solarzians I'm influenced by, David Rosenthal, Jay Rosenberg, Johanna, Johanna Zeip, Ken Westfall, David Landy, Paul Coates, they're all very influenced by Sellers' views about conceptual thinking and about knowledge. They all think Sellers had a good idea about an inner theory of sensible representation, non-conceptual representation. None of them think that that's going to entail the falsity of our ordinary ontology of, of colored physical objects. So I'm, I'm in the business of looking for a theory like that. And secondly, there's nothing, uh, I don't have to hold that the manifest image on, uh, ontology is, is wholesale false in order to be a scientific realist, to be a Persian, and to be all the sorts of things I, li I like from Sellers. So, so I just don't agree with Sellers' transcendental idealist view that the manifest image is strictly speaking false with regard to its object ontology. But I accept all the other stuff from part one on Sellers' Kantianism. So, um, in a little more detail, it gets interesting when you're reading. My teacher was Jay Rosenberg, who was a student of Sellers. Science and Metaphysics, Chapter 1, is a very complex chapter. 
Sellers gives you hints that he's not saying Kant held this view, that he's not saying Kant held Sellers' theory of sensa or sense impressions. He's saying there's certain distinctions Kant needs and even feels and that he ought to have, but he didn't have. And in particular, it's this, radic it's this view that, as Pritchard put it, perception rests on a mistake. We think we're perceiving colored objects out there. We're really caused to think about colored objects as out there when they're really in here, to put it crudely. Jay Rosenberg then tended to write more like my teacher, who was wonderful, but he tended to write like that was Kant's view, too. And so I write on Kant as well. I have a, an introductory book on Kant. And I, I, I think Sellers and Rosenberg, because, because of Sellers, have a strongly ontological view of Kant's things in themselves. And I think when I work on Kant, I'm more attracted to the view that sees it as a limit concept and so on. I won't get into that. But there's no accident that they read Kant in the way that they do, where the real truth is the things in themselves, unlike, in my view, Kant. That's not Kant's view of things in themselves. Um, but for Sellers and Kant, they're preparing the space for the scientific story. OK. Um, some people think picturing maybe gives us, uh, I mean, what I want to say about picturing in Sellers is this is the idea that there's a naturalistic correspondence between, between what? Between language in the world, when you, when you utter certain things, that pictures certain states of affairs. Between thoughts and the world, because thoughts are inner mentalese. Between animal thoughts and the world, they picture the world, those are certain organic states that were evolved such that they play certain roles that track the world. And between, and here it only comes now, color sense impressions and the world. Some people write as if Seller's theory of picturing was about his theory of sense impressions. They're getting that from overgeneralizing from science and metaphysics chapter one. Um, for Sellers, the story about color is just a very small story at the end of the day. When we're picturing the world in science, we're going to be using scientific theories that, you know, when you say there goes an electron in the cloud chamber, that's a perceptual judgment for Sellers, that the cloud chamber's pink or green is only going to be relevant in the philosophy of mind. So people forget this about Sellers. It's, um, He's giving you the theory of sense impressions as the best philosophy of mind, in his view. And that's what I don't see as plausible. Although I'm perfectly happy to have non-conceptual sense impressions. But I don't think we need a non-physical to new theory of consciousness that quantum physicists will discover and so on. You might say, well, what's your theory, O'Shea, of qualia, and I admit it's a serious, I, that's this problem that Sellers was feeling was the problem we all feel today. He's in the space that David Chalmers is in, and he's giving you a theory. And I'd like to be out of that space, but. Okay, we're coming not too far now. Um, the main challenges for what I want to take from Kant and Sellers is all that stuff in part one the theory of knowledge, the theory of meaning, the semantics, the, um, the theory of perception, everything in Sellers, except for the claim that the manifest image is somehow a priori knowable to be false. But I think the challenge still is, I mean, I wrote a book trying to do it just in Sellers' own terms. Um, what is this view that says normativity is irreducible and constitutive of thought and meaning, and yet entirely naturalistically explainable. And I, I've said some things about that in the things I've written. I think Dionysus has said a lot of interesting things too, and others. And it, I think it has to do with a certain pragmatist view of assertion, and there's some things in Brandom that are valuable for that. But that is the project, to, exp to give a fully naturalistic account of what this conceptual thinking being is.
Okay. So I thought I'd throw in a few further points just um, not related. So in the, in the articles I gave you that that book just came out in the last week or two, that Sellers and his legacy book, um, these are some further issues that I just thought I'd raise at the end in case anyone wants to discuss them. I think Kant is a scientific realist. Uh, you can get this from the passages on magnet magnetic matter in the postulates. You can, uh, Kant has no problem with unobservables as long as they're in the space-time lawful realm. And I think Kant has a fascinating theory of empirical conceptual change. And science is all about empirical conceptual change. It's true you can get, uh, you can't get Newton's physics from Kant's metaphysical foundations of natural science. You need Newton to get Newton's physics, the actual mathematical law. And even in that stuff for, in Kant about forces and matter, you need uh, an empirical concept of motion and touch and stuff. Um, Kant is a scientific realist, not only that, he's got a theory of self-correcting theory change in the appendix to the dialectic. So I think Kant's empirical realism is a scientific realism, and my scientific realism of that kind would fall within that Kantian domain. David Landy has done this recently. I don't see why we can't be Salarzian scientific realists, but reject his two arguments his two non-Kantian arguments for the falsity of the manifest image and just be good old empirical realists and scientific realists of a Kantian kind. That's the way I see my, myself as trying to, that's the view I find plausible. Um, is Seller's scientific realism in that strong version that the manifest image is false and the scientific image is, a, is what tells you the truth? Is that a transcendental or a priori or conceptual truth in Sellers or a contingent discovery? Is that something Sellers can prove from his armchair? I asked this to a table full of Solarzians, Brandon McDowell, all, they were all, we were all together. And it, it went about half and half, I'd say. Um, there's a slide, a quote here from Science and Metaphysics. Let me just read that. I'm almost done. I'm on the last slide. Here's Sellers. If we take the position that concepts pertaining to microphysical objects are merely conceptual instruments, that is, if we're not scientific realists, if we're more like instrumentalists, if we take the ordinary life world to be what's real and science just as fancy devices for predicting it, this was the reigning view in the mid 20th century. Um, then the world as we perceive it to be is unthreatened. This is where I'm reading it as a contingent thesis. If instrumentalism would work, if Ben Fratzen's view was adequate, then our philosophy could be essentially Aristotelian and we can say of the Aristotelian world of contemporary Aristotelians such as Strassen, that it exists not only as something represented, objective reality, but also in itself. So I think Sellers is a realist, and you know, common sense is realist, he's a realist. You don't, you know, I think Sellers was reared in Russell and Moore. You, if you distinguish the act of thinking from the object you think about, I don't want to say he's as crude as John Searle or any, I'm sorry, am I on recording? John Searle's very good, but that, some, so, sometimes realism can be put very bluntly. But the basic instincts are realist, not just because of his heritage or, or dogma, but I think he thinks it's plausible. Well, let me say more than that. I think he thinks Kant gives you empirical realism. I think he's got arguments that you can't, you're not knowing your own mental state, you're knowing a world independent of you. That's the realism Sellers always held. Scientific realism is a contingent thesis. It turns out that it's the better explanation of things. So according to our analysis, this would mean, according to our analysis, Sellers' own scientific realism. Well, let me, no, according to his theory of truth and, pic, and so on, picturing, that story, if instrumentalism were adequate, would mean that basic singular statements in this Strassonian framework 
depict objects, picture objects, in a way which is in principle adequate. I mean, people sometimes think picturing has to do with the scientific image. Every matter of factual framework for sellers pictures, non-conceptually. And if the Strassonian framework were successful, if it were adequate, that would picture the world as it is in itself. For as we've seen, though truth does not admit of degrees, adequacy of depicting does. Now he's going to bring in his view about more adequate picturing. Um, if, there, if there were reason to think that basic singular statements in the language of theoretical physics would depict the world in a more adequate way, what's that reason? It's the actual success of theoretical physics. I think if you hold a phenomenal theory of gases in the manifest image, Sellers thinks you're demonstrably mistaken. You can be shown mathematically that the kinetic theory of gases of unobservables gives you a better theory of what there is. So Sellers thinks that science shows that it's the better way of depicting the world and Strassen loses. This is what I mean by the kuhn feyerabend ontological replacement view of science is the heart of Sellers' transcendental idealism. That, that already gives you the view that the, the Charles Boyle gas law is the world of appearances, the kinetic theory of gases is the world of things in themselves, and then that will be explained as appearances, a new theory of things in themselves. But the main point I want to say here is all the relevant distinctions are already in the manifest image. Picturing's in the manifest image. Things in themselves would be in the manifest image. And Aristotle would give you things in themselves if that were the most adequate. It's just a contingent truth that science does, explains things better. He thinks, I think you can have a different view. Okay. So, and so on. So I just, uh, finishing up here. Um, I mentioned before that some people take sense impressions to be some particularly important thing in, in Seller's theory of picturing. It's not. It's one application of it. There's language, there's mental ease, there's animals, and then there's color. I've always been curious. I, I quite like Seller's reading of Kant on inner sense, where your awareness of your own mental life is a kind of second order representing or thinking of your own thoughts. David Rosenthal has generalized that in a certain way. And I'm thinking of possible papers I'm going to write for Antonio's volume where I take things a step further on Seller's on Kant. And uh, these are the sorts of issues I'm interested in exploring further. And finally, um, as I've said, I have this view that Sellers thought, but I could be wrong. No matter how ideal you make the scientific image, although I've been having good discussions with Dionysus about this, um, this thing, the I think, and thoughts, that's what's there all the way to the end. And his student, Paul Churchland, disagreed with him on that. And um, that's just one of those interesting disagreements. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.